All right, we're going to start with one. So it says domain, range, increasing, decreasing, constant behavior, and then find f of zero. So we're going to break it down into all those parts. Okay, so if I start with domain, remember domain is the x values. So as I'm looking at this graph from left to right, because that's what the x would be, what is the furthest x left? Negative four. Negative four. And it, does it get a bracket or a parentheses? Bracket because it's a solid point. Then as we move to the right, we have coordinates all the way down here, and then it stops, and there's a gap here. So we have to stop our domain, right? And that would be at negative 2. This time it's an open dot, so it gets a parentheses. Then my graph picks up again here and continues to here. Again, there's a gap here, so we'll stop it. So that starts at negative 1, solid dot, so it gets a bracket. Stops at positive one, open dot, so it gets a parentheses. Then again, there's a break, which is why we stop and start that. And starts up again here, and it points on to the right with an arrow. So although that arrow is pointing down, it's also pointing right, correct? So I would get a bracket on two to infinity with a parentheses on the infinity. It's different for every graph. Or at least for this one. Like this, so the first one's the furthest X. So, so like if you wanted to highlight it, like this matches this part. We always start left and work our way right. Okay. Awesome. On both domain and increasing and decreasing behavior. We start left, work our, our way right. And then... Where'd you pull negative one in one? Say that again. Where'd you pull negative one in one from? From the red segment in the middle, from this part here. Those values are from negative one to positive one. And then the blue is the, the last little arm. And the only reason oh. these are completely separated is because there's breaks in those graphs as they move from left to right. Sometimes it's one fluid graph and there's no separation. Sometimes there's an overlap, right? And then there's no separation. If this, the blue thing had started here, then this would be one fluid from negative one to positive infinity. It, it stops and starts because there's a break in those x values and space in between. So the homework ones overlapped, right? One was one fluid thing and one overlapped, so there was no stop start. Okay, now let's do the x values. So I'm going to clear off this so we can highlight again. Oops, that's not clearing. That's making it worse. Hang on. Okay, now range, we go bottom to top. So what's the lowest y? Negative infinity. Negative infinity. This arrow tells me it's going to keep going down. Then as I, wait, I work my way up, right, that stops at positive 1. This would be 1. But over here, there's a value for one, and it goes up to here and stops here. So the break in this graph comes here, which means I go from negative infinity up to, it still goes up here, two, bracket on the two, then there's a break, and my next value is just one y, because it's a horizontal line, at three. So it looks like this three by itself. It's not three to anything. It is just three. There's nothing above three. There's nothing below three in that section. You will put brackets on both sides because that's an included point. All of the three is included. If it, open if it was an open circle, we wouldn't include it at all. Even though these are open, right? Even though these are open, these values inside yeah. say include three. So the brackets say, am I including three as part of this range or not? Even though these don't, the ones in between do. Oh, okay. Yep. So the bracket has to be there. Wait, what did you do with the horizontal line there? Which one? The, that's where, that's, this value is three. That's where the break happened. If I look from bottom to top, there was a break in my graph. Horizontally, there's a break in my graph. Yeah. Um, for the three, the one that's like the constant line. Yep. If there's only one that's fully shaded, why do you put brackets on both sides? 
because if three is part of my graph at any place, it gets a bracket. And then so even though it's open here, right? It's Even if it was open at both here and here, but the, this in between was solid, three is included in my range. So I give it a bracket. is a y value, this two. Oh, I was looking at the other one. Yeah, no, 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 we went bottom to top that way. Because the arrow's pointing down. Yeah. That's what I did yesterday, I kept looking at the x value. Gotta go bottom, work your way up. So bottom to top is range. So main left to right. Okay, now increasing, decreasing, constant, right? So increasing, decreasing, constant. This first little part of my graph is doing what? Decreasing. Decreasing. And the x values are what we give. So from negative 4 to negative 2, it's decreasing. And remember, a point itself cannot be decreasing, so these always get parentheses. Then I get to this part. And that's what, Audrey, you called it it already. Constant. Now, a constant point can be a point that's constant. So this starts as a bracket. Negative 1 stops at positive 1, but it gets a parenthesis because it's an open dot. Is that the expression that you're talking yep. about? Yep. So if a constant, if a segment starts or stops constant, so it's constant on that side or it's constant on this side with a solid dot, that's the only time you're going to see a bracket in increasing and decreasing behavior. And from there, this would be? Mm, it's falling, right? Yeah. So it's decreasing from 2 to positive infinity. And there's no increasing this time. X. So to determine if it's rising or falling, we're looking at the slope on that line, right? Is it increasing or is it decreasing? When we're writing the notation, it's the x value. Because again, we're going left to right. So the only thing right now in this segment, in domain range, increasing, decreasing, costing, the only thing that's y is range. But then when we evaluate here, we use the y's again, right? So if I want to find, which is what's next, f of 0, now I need the y value that matches that. So that's the only other time you're going to use the y. So what would be the y that matches when x is 0? 3. The y that matches when x is 0, right? Inside the parentheses is your x. So x is 0 here. And this is what part of my graph? x is 0. And I give the y coordinate of that, which is 3. Wherever it hits that point, yep. OK, then this we rushed a lot yesterday. So I want to go back through it which is even, odd, neither. And then I'm also going to add in the, like, the symmetry, okay? because you saw that on the homework too. So remember even, to test for even, we're going to take x and replace it with negative x. Same for odd and same, well, obviously, if it's neither, it's neither, right? We don't have to test for neither. But, but what we're looking for is what happens when we plug that negative x in. If everything goes back to the original sign, then it's even. If every term changes sign from its original, from its original, then it's odd. And then if it's neither, it's neither. And if it's even, it's symmetric to the y-axis. And if it's odd, it's symmetric to the origin. Think O and O, origin and odd.
The only other thing it could be is symmetric to the x-axis, except if it's a function. If it's symmetric to the x-axis, then it would fail the vertical line test, so it can't be a function. So a function cannot be symmetric to the x-axis. Can't happen. It would fail the vertical line test, and then it can't be a function, right? Think about what makes something symmetric to the x-axis. An absolute value of y fails the function test, and a y squared fails the function test. So those two cannot be. You will see stuff like, which we'll review a little bit later, but like if I had y equals x squared plus three, now I could test that for x-axis symmetry because it's not a f of x. Does that make sense? But if you see f of x, it cannot be symmetric to the x-axis. And things can't be both even and odd, but they can be symmetric to the x-axis and the y-axis and the origin. So like a circle would be symmetric to all three, x-axis, y-axis, and origin, but it's not a function. So you don't have to worry about it just yet. I just want you to know that that can happen. Yeah. Neither is, it can be to the x-axis, right? But it doesn't have to be. So it can be none. There was also like x equals. Y equals x, yeah. I don't know actually why a web sign pulls it in there. To, it's just, to, I don't even do it. Okay. Yeah, because if you just did symmetric to the y equals x line, that's symmetric to the origin. I don't know, I hated that part of the question, but you can't take it out, yeah. Like literally draw a vertical line. And if it, so like on the homework, you had a circle, right? And if I draw a vertical line through here, it intersects that at more than one point. This fails the vertical line test and it's not a function. So that question was not a function. The other one was. All right, so if I look at that, determine if the function is even odd or neither, then I'm gonna take and plug in a negative x. So I'm gonna do negative x squared plus three negative x to the third. What happens to negative x squared? becomes positive x squared. What happens to negative x to the third? Stays negative. And then I have a negative x to the third times three, so I get minus three x to the third. Compare this to the original. Are they the same? No. no if they were, that would be even and y-axis. Are both of them the opposite signs? Yeah. No. If they were, that would be odd in origin. This is a neither scenario. Oops. And no symmetry because it can't be x. Say again. Because you can't, re you're replacing just the x value. Whatever's happening to that x you still keep. You can't get rid of an exponent. Hang on. I'm just replacing x with negative x. I can't get rid of the rest of it. But then the squaring is going to make it positive again. But then how come we get rid of it? How come we, because it's still squared, it's just the sign that changes. Okay, if you want to break it apart, which I think is way more complicated, but this would be at negative x squared, right? Would be a negative one squared and an x squared. This is what we're getting rid of. This still has to stay x squared. We can't change that exponent. Okay, now Does I that make sense? Now I know we did that. Okay. We're not, I I we're not plugging in like a vet. We're not saying that's negative 1 and we're getting rid of the x. We're saying it's still an x. It's just a negative x. I just completely forgot how that works. Yeah, yeah. Today, this week is not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what was the other question? Uh, so if it's neither, it's always no symmetry? No. If it's a function, yes. So if it says f of x equals, then yes. If it's neither, it's none. So what would it look like if it's... It, it would be y equals, well, actually, it would be like y squared equals x plus 3. Be... That is, has x-axis symmetry. That is neither even nor odd. No, because if I plug in, the rule is a negative y. That's why I don't want to confuse you too much. I want you to know it exists, but it's not in functions. So before, if it's on your test, we'll review the y part. 
before, but for right now, all of these questions are functions, f of x equals. So if this, the rule for or, I mean for x axis, is instead of plugging in a negative x, we plug in a negative y. So when I plug in negative y, this goes back to the original, right? You see that it goes back to the original, and that has x-axis symmetry. But a function can't have x-axis symmetry because there's an f of x and not a y. Isn't this just the same as everything that has? I'm not going to say that because I think I saw a question. We're not done, but I think I saw a question that has a y, so that's why I'll review it again if that's the case. Yeah, don't worry about it. That's what she was asking about, the y equals x. Don't worry about it. We're just going to ask even odd, neither. X, Y, origin, none. Okay? So even goes with Y. Odd goes with origin. If it's a function, no X. If it is, If it has a Y in it like this, then the rule is to replace it with negative Y. But again, we'll review that before that happens again. Okay? I don't want to confuse you with it. If it's a function, it can't have X axis symmetry because then it would fail your vertical line test. Because this graph is actually a parabola turned on its side, this y squared, and it would fail. This y squared is a parabola turns on its side. Like that. And that would fail your vertical line test, so it can't be a function. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, this question came up in the, about the homework. Uh, the question on the range. So remember the lowest y is what you're looking for. So although this point is here as negative 5, it dips down below that. And the, na the lowest point is negative 6. So it would be negative 6 with a bracket because the line or that curve counts the solid dot up to the highest point, which is 3. One's open, one's solid, which means it gets a bracket. All right, so I'm going to do the notes and then I'll go back to that homework question. But don't let me forget before you leave, okay? So the good news is, like I said, most of this I'm hoping is not as complicated. There is some stop and start to the graph, which tends to throw you guys off. But it's, the, the real focus on today is to lay the foundation for the next section, which is transforming graphs, like sliding them right, left, up, down, all this stuff, okay? Which is actually super easy and very fun because there's not a lot of work to it. Again, I know I'm a nerd, but I enjoy that stuff, okay? Not going to do to my free time, but... When you have to do the math, that part is not that hard. So this is the foundation to it. These are called parent functions. So a parent function is just what your actual function looks like before anything is added or subtracted to this number or multiplied by it. This is just what my initial function looks like. The first one is absolute value, and the absolute value looks like a V. So all of these have little arrows on them, and they're so hard to draw on PowerPoint, so you don't have them yet. Yep, absolute value looks like a V. Think absolute value, the word value starts with a V, that's what it looks like. A square root function is actually like half a parabola turned on its side, and it looks, let me make this color different. It looks like this, and again, it has an arrow on the end. This one has a dot to start with, so nothing's happening to the left of that. And then the arrow points to the right. Quadratic is our parabolas. And these are things that we know, hopefully, a little bit better. It looks like a U, okay? With its vertex, that's what that point is called, on 0, 0 for my parent function. The cubic function happens if we were to take this, if we took this quadratic function, this parabola, and we cut it here and we flip this down, that's what this looks like, okay? So if I took the left side of my parabola and I flipped it upside down, that's what the cubic function looks like. And if you think about why that happens, quadratics will always result in positives because we're squaring it, whereas a cubic would have negative values, so it would point down. And then the cube root function is just like the square root function if I also take the other side and flip it down. So it goes up to the right here, and there should be an arrow there, and then it goes down and left like that. So what we are going to do, first of all, you got to memorize these, because what we're going to do in the next section is it's going to say take and shift this up a unit, shift this down a unit, shift it to the right, shift it to the left, flip it upside down, make it narrow, make it wide, that kind of stuff, okay? But let's practice 
domain range increasing and decreasing on these. So what would be the domain of my absolute value function? Negative infinity to positive infinity. My arrows are pointing both left and right. What would be the range? Zero, Zero infinity. to infinity. Is there an open dot here? No. no. So even though it doesn't have a solid dot drawn, if it's part of the graph, if zero, zero is part of the graph, and there's not an open dot there, it means it's a solid dot and that gets a bracket. Now increasing, decreasing. So the first part of my graph before it changes direction is doing this. Would you consider that to be increasing or decreasing? Mm -hmm. Decreasing from? Good, negative infinity to zero, parentheses on the zero because a point can't be increasing and decreasing. Then my direction changes and I start increasing from zero to positive infinity with no part of this that is constant. Does a zero get a bracket Nope, remember, a zero, like a point can't be increasing and decreasing. Oh, okay. Yeah. I like them. Why can't point? Just kidding, I just answered it. <laughs> it's no movement, right? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to work right down. I'm going to go to quadratic next because what is true about quadratic? Look at the shape of my quadratic and look at the shape of my absolute value. They're almost exactly the same. The arrow is pointing in the same direction. The domain is the same. The range is the same, right? My decreasing is the same. My increasing, everything's the same. The only difference is the shape. The absolute value is more of a V. It's a sharp V and the quadratic has a U. Everything else is the same, which means my domain is the same, negative infinity to positive infinity. My range is the same, zero to positive infinity. My increasing is the same, zero to positive infinity. And my decreasing is the same, negative infinity to zero. And there's no part of this graph that's constant. If the domain range increasing, decreasing, they're the same, then why are they changing? Because what happens to the values is what changes. So think about what happens, and it, and it happens like. Obviously, if I plug in zero here, it's going to be zero. If I plug in zero there, it's going to be zero. Right? Zero, absolute value of zero is zero. Absolute, zero squared is zero. So that's why they both have that same point. Right? And I plug in one here. One squared is still one. Absolute value is still one. So those points would also be aligned. But what happens in between the zeros and the ones? Let's plug in a half. A half in absolute value comes out a half. Right? But a half squared comes out a fourth. So it causes it to bottom out a little bit, which is why that curve happens. And then outside the one, let's say we plug in two. Plug in two here, it's two. These lines have slopes, that's one. Up one, over one, up one, over one, up one, over one. This, I squared to is four. So that curve is causing a jump higher each time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right, you're welcome. All right, square root. Let me erase off the... This time I have a point there at zero, right? So what is my domain? Zero, zero to positive infinity. My range? Zero to positive infinity. Lowest y is zero. That arrow is going to keep going up. For the parent functions, yes, but then we're going to start to move these around. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's the fun part. Not today, tomorrow. All right, increasing. So this is increasing the whole way. It's increasing from zero to positive infinity. It still gets a parenthesis and not a bracket because the point can't be increasing. There is no de decreasing and there is no constant. Cubic function, arrows pointing left to right, domain, negative infinity to positive infinity. 
Arrow is pointing down and up. Range, negative infinity to positive infinity. And even though it looks like it kind of slows down around that origin, those points are still continuing to get bigger, which means it is an increasing from negative infinity to positive infinity, not decreasing or constant at all. Can you say it again? So the cubic function is just for x. Yeah, pretty much. Because think about it. So the reason why the other ones have differences, because if you're squaring something, it can never be negative, right? So we're going to shift these eventually. But our initial parent function can never be negative, which is why that parabola points in one direction. Whereas a cubic function, you can plug in a negative and a positive and get out of it a positive and a negative. Same thing with a cube root. Like a square root, we can't square root a negative number. So that's why none of this part of my graph exists. But a cube root, you can cube root a negative number, so that's why the arrows point both directions. Domain would be all real numbers again, negative infinity to positive infinity. Range, also all real numbers because it points down and points up. And again, it is increasing. So it starts low and it works its way up, increasing negative infinity to positive infinity. And then no decreasing and no constant. So when doing cubic and cubic roots, No, because there's no solid point to start and stop it. Even when we're doing the normal. Correct. So main and range on cube root and cubic root will always be negative infinity to positive infinity. No matter what kind of shift we give it. You're welcome. Okay, so again, that really lays more of a foundation for tomorrow's section. What we're going to do is then take these and shift them up and down, okay? It helps a little bit with today, but more that is more, I think, laying the foundation for tomorrow than it is anything else, okay? What we're going to do today is graph what are called piecewise functions. So remember we evaluated these. We said if it's, a, if it's got a certain point, I plug it into one or the other, right? Now the graphs of these are going to be different too. It's basically giving me parts, so there's going to be ranges that are separate kinds of graphs, okay? So this is piecewise because it has two parts to it, right? It's not just saying graph 2x plus 3. It's saying graph 2x plus 3 if x is less than or equal to 1, and graph negative x plus 4 if x is greater than 1. So I'm actually going to show you two ways to do this. And in my opinion, if there are lines, which these are both lines, right? It is easier to do the first method, okay? So I'm, again, I'll show you both, but I'm gonna highlight this in different color because we're gonna graph it in different color. So the first thing I'm gonna do is graph y equals 2x plus 3 as though that was the only thing I'm graphing. So how do I graph that? So it's in slope intercept, right? Start at the 3, up 2 into the right one, or down 2 to the left one, either way, right? And then draw yourself a line. Now I'm going to graph the second one as though it was there by itself. y equals negative x plus 4 which means I'd start at positive four. I go down one to the right one, down one to the right one, and I draw myself a line. Ooh, that was not a good line. Now, if I left it the way that it is, would this pass or fail your vertical line test? It would fail it. We cannot leave it the way it is because this is a function. F of X is saying this is a function. If it's a function, they can't overlap which is where the second parts of those statements come into play. For the first one, it says only keep the blue line for values of x that are less than or equal to 1. So on my blue line, I'm going to find my x where x is 1, which is here. Let me do it in a different color. Here lies. That's where x is 1, right? Do we see that? Now, if I said keep what's less than that, 
What side of my line am I keeping? The left or the right? Left. left, because left is less than. So then I literally erase the part of the graph that would be greater than one. So that, that blue line, right, the one that we graph first, can only be true where x is less than or equal to one. So I find where x is equal to one, and I keep only what's left end of it, I erase what's to the right. Because x is 1 here, right? And that is where the coordinate fell on the blue line. Oh. So you look at the x and Correct. Then do the same thing for the green. So the green says where it is greater than 1. I still need to go where it's 1, which is here. But greater than means I don't include that dot. So it gets an open dot. I still need that dot, but it needs to be an open dot. And greater than is what? Left or right? The right. right. So I erase everything that's left. Zoom in. Oh, man. Now would that pass my vertical line test? Why not? But what's the true about one point? What's an open dot tell you? It's actually not a dot, right? So it's a dot only to say that the very next little teeny tiny point next to it is part of my graph, but that part itself is not. So it does pass the vertical line test. So when you get to the end of your partial, which is what, I mean, your piecewise function, those graphs should be able to match, I mean, pass your vertical line test. So when Notability started doing the partial erase, I was like, this is so good. Yeah, because now you could, because you used to have to like erase the whole line. Okay, but think about the fact that you're gonna do this on paper. So you're gonna erase with an actual pencil. Okay, so you can either make it like not so dark and then go back and darken it but you're gonna do it with an actual pencil. Okay, now I'm gonna show you the second method for the next one. This, this sign here. Wait, how do I know which direction? Is that what you said or no? The, that inequality sign. So the first one says less than one. So less than would be left. Greater than would be right. But then you're you're so you oh. erase the part that's not in that range. So that is only true for those values. So that blue line should only be there for where x is less than or equal to 1, and the green line should only be there for where x is greater than 1. You're welcome. Okay, second one, I could do exactly the way we just did. So I would draw my line for the first one. I would keep only where x is less than or equal to negative 4. And then I would keep the bottom one where it's greater than negative four. Or your other option is to plug those values in. So actually set up like a T chart, okay? And I would start, so I'm gonna do the first one. Start at the number that's given to you, so negative four. And then because it's less than, work left. So I would do the number that's given to me. And if it's less than, do numbers that are smaller than that, plug them in. So negative one half times negative four minus six. This becomes positive two minus six, which is negative four. Negative five, so negative one half times negative five minus six. That's five halves minus six, or 12 halves. And I get negative three and a half. Plug in negative six. and I get three minus six, which is negative three. So when I graph this, let me make it a little bit darker actually. 
when I graph this, the points I graph, negative 4, negative 4, negative 5, negative 3 and a half, negative 6, negative 3, are going to be the points in the direction I want it to graph. So I don't have to erase the other side. Then for the next one, I'm going to do a T-chart as well. I'm still going to start at negative 4, but I'm going to remind myself that that point is going to be an open dot. And this time it's greater than. So go greater than negative 4, which would be negative 3, negative 2, and plug those values in. Negative 4 plus 5, which is 1. Negative 3 plus 5, which is 2, negative 2 plus 5, which is 3. Negative 4, 1, open dot. Negative 3, 2. Negative 2, 3. And the arrows would go to the right because it's greater than. You don't have to. You can do the first method. Oh. Yep. So you could do either method. And my advice, honestly, is if they are both lines, it's easier to do the first. Draw it. Erase it. We are going to get into ones that have parabolas and square roots and that kind of stuff. And those are going to be easier to plot points because you are not yet familiar with what those graphs look like when we shift them. After we get past tomorrow, it's probably easier to do them both the first method, which is graph it and erase but we haven't talked about what happens when we start to move these around, which you'll see in a second. So number three has a line. So I'm gonna do it the same as I did the first method. I'm gonna switch the order so that it's y equals mx plus b, x plus two. I go to two, I draw my line, slope of one, and then it's x is less than or equal to two, so I go to where x is 2, which is here, and I erase everything to the right of it. Now next comes a parabola. I don't know what that shape looks like yet. I know it's a u at some point, but I don't know exactly yet. So in that case, I would recommend plugging in points. So I would start with the 2. And greater than 2 means 3, 4, plug them in. 2 squared minus 2, 3 squared minus 2, 4 squared minus 2. Good morning. Good, how are you? Good, how are you? <laughs> and again, remind yourself that that first one's an open dot. So it's 2, 2, open dot. It's 3, 7, solid dot, and it's 4, 14. So I'm not going to plot it exactly, but I know it goes up in that direction. Yeah. The point. So I start with the cutoff number that they give me. Whether it's an or equal to or not. If it's or equal to, I know that point's going to get a solid dot, but if it's not, I know it gets an open dot, but I still have to plot that point. And then look at the relationship here. That says greater than two. So I start at two and I do three points now moving in the greater than position. So two, then three, then four. If I was plugging in points and it was less than two, I would do two, then one, then zero. And then you, because we don't know these shapes yet, after tomorrow, you should be able to actually plot a parabola and then erase it. But right now we don't know anything about those shapes yet. Oh, I'm plugging them in to here. You're plugging the top here? Yep, the x values. Oh. Yep. Oh, how did you the Cuz it's in x plus 2. So it's still I just switched the order. Right? y equals mx plus b. The m is 1. Oh. And b is 2. Yeah. And this that's not a slope cuz that's a parabola. So I had a plug in point. 
for right now. Tomorrow, we're gonna, I'm going to teach you how to graph those using transformations, but for right now, we're plugging in points. All right, I'm, I'm going to send you on your way, but I want you to look at number four. Number four has three parts, which means there's going to be three starts and stops, okay? I would still use the same. I would do if it's a line, which this one is, graph and erase. So positive one, up two to the right three, down two and to the left three, only where it's less than or equal to one, negative one. So I'd come here and I would get rid of everything to the right of it. For the next two parts, this one is actually gonna look like this. I'm gonna cheat and just let you see what it would look like. This would be an open dot and this would be here. It would just be those points. They're both, actually this one is a bracket. I wrote on top of it. Yeah, so the, the one's solid and one's open. And then the last one, again, I would plug in points, but we're out of time, so I'm going to show you, would be like this, and it would point down, which means that where it's one would be an open dot and my arrow is going to point down like that. Again, I would point plots in the ones you don't know. The lines you can use your slope intercept, but the other ones you've got to point some plots. So, like I would have to plug in negative one, zero, and one for the middle one. And I'd have to plug in one, two, and three for the bottom one. All right, guys, I got to let you go. Have a great day. Um, Ethan Elias, hang back just for a second so I can answer your question. But the rest of you have a great day. Tomorrow, we will do more with the graphs. This is not heavy. Like, I don't want you to stress too much about this. The lines, obviously, you need to know how to, to graph. But tomorrow, we will do more with the parabolas and that kind of stuff, okay?